Well, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, coming to uh, the Aztec meeting feels a little bit like coming home because, you know, as that uh, sort of overextensive bio <laughs> sort of suggested, you know, I've been working in the STEM education field for many years. You know, one thing that um, President Obama always emphasized to us, and I think it's really important, is that almost all of our accomplishments are we accomplishments, not I accomplishments. So I just want to put that caveat, which is that uh, in so much of what we did together, we did because of all of you. And really, we saw our work as empowering all of you. Now, before I start, I just want to do a little bit of just bragging on some of the people I got a chance to work with at the White House. Part of the reason I'm here is not only that I adore all of you, but that you are uh, led by one of my favorite people in the world, um, which is Kristen Dorgalo. And can we just give Kristen, Chris, Billy, and the Aztec team a big round of applause? You know, I remember meeting with Kristen, like, not just before she took the job, but after, and they were already scheming up lots of ways to make this conference as productive as possible for all of you. And Kristen has been on the road, Kristen and Chris, basically every single week since she started, because a big part of what people say in this job is you want to actually go meet the members. Well, that takes a lot of work. And uh, I don't know if all of you have gotten a visit, but it is incredible work going on in the field, as those videos showed. And I'm so um, excited that Kristen is in this role. You know, Aztec was one of the first sets of communities that we engage with in the White House. Um, and I'm, I know that the next 10 years will be just as fruitful. Now, does somebody, maybe we'll just do this as a row of show of hands, but does anybody have a guess as to why I titled my talk Eyeballs in the Fridge? Anybody? Any hands? Okay, let me explain. So what, there was a research paper that came out about 10 years ago, and it was a research paper where they basically went out and interviewed tons of scientists and said, oh, you know, is there some childhood moment that you can look back to that really, you know, it's like when, what got you really interested in science? And they interviewed lots of people and they had lots of different stories. But the reason why they titled the paper Eyeballs in the Fridge is one of the scientists that they interviewed had this very clear memory of, as a very young kid with an older sibling, opening the fridge. And in the fridge, sitting in a little jar, was a cow eyeball, just staring at him. And he said, you know, I think his uh, older sibling had done some sort of experiment uh, and had gotten the chance to bring the eyeball home and had just done what you always do, which is put the eyeball in the fridge. And he opened up the fridge door and said, what is that? And said that from that moment on, uh, he was hooked. And so I just, one, I just love the title. Uh, but the second, I just think that we underappreciate what gets all of us excited about the things we do. And that connects so much to the work that you all do every day. So I want to start by just saying thank you. Um, I know the work that you all do is so important. And I think, you know, uh, day to day, we sort of are always lost in our schedules you know, getting the next exhibit up, uh, making sure, you know, uh, the, you know, the next activity is exciting, just putting on every single, you know, I feel like when, uh, I remember talking to a newspaper editor where they said like, you know, every day is a fresh day. You gotta like start over. And so I just um, wanna thank you all for all the hard work and the fact that you're spending all the time at this conference uh, working to get better. The next thing I just wanna sort of emphasize is that, um, this conversation and what we're all working on couldn't come at a more uh, pivotal time. And that's for a couple of reasons. So uh, let me just sort of run through at least some of the um, uh, reasons why I think the role that the Aztec community has uh, couldn't be more important and some of the larger issues that are happening. So the first is, and I don't need to tell you this, but we exist in a unique political time. Uh, 
uh, even during the course of this conference, a lot has happened. Um, I still live in Washington, D.C., and I will tell you that I get this kind of, whenever I talk to somebody on the phone or I meet them, they're like, how's it going? And uh, I tell them, you're living it too. Uh, so the, the big thing that I think that's important is that we are in a period of political vacuum that exists on science and STEM education in a way that I think the community hasn't really experienced for a long time. And in that, you know, there are big questions around what is the role of science in the future? How are we gonna make sure our kids are learning and prepared for the future? And we're gonna come out of this one way or another. And I think the work that you all are doing to advance the field of how do we get our students engaged in learning is gonna build that next phase of what is gonna be our national agenda. So not, rather than seeing this as a moment of, uh, of just a vacuum, I think it's all the more important for us to build on the local models that, other, that policymakers in the future can advance. The second, I would say, is I continue and, uh, you know, to continue to be amazed by how much the, the you know, there's a famous sort of uh, adage around software eating the world, but I just continue to be amazed by how much computer science as a field continues to sort of reverberate across STEM education. And the, and the reason is, you know, when I started uh, working for President uh, Obama in 2009, there was a recent uh, survey that had come out. And it was a survey of parents, and they, the title of the survey was Important But Not For Me. And the reason why the researchers labeled it that was they'd interviewed all these parents and they'd done the traditional survey, which is they listed off, you know, it's like the classic acronym thing. They're like, what do you think about science for your kid? What do you think about technology, engineering, and math? And you know, a, bunch, a subset of parents said, I think it's really important. I, I want my kid to exceed in it. But a, a really surprising large number of parents said, you know, it's important, but my kid's more of a writing kid, or my kid's more of an English kid. And what was really surprising was, you know, if you then asked uh, parents, well, what about reading and writing? Is your, you know, think of those as optional? Uh, and they said, no, no, no. I, you wouldn't say, like, my kid's just not into reading, you know? My kid's just not into writing. Um, and so that was a pretty alarming stat as to the cultural gap that exists in the United States around science as this thing that's a nice to have, not a must have. And the thing that I think is really interesting about computer science is for the past three or four years, Gallup has been running a survey where they go out and they interview parents and they say, do you think your child should be getting exposure to computer science while growing up. You wanna know how many parents want that? More than 90%. So whether it's because they never got to experience it and they don't have the baggage of it or whatever else, parents think this is really important. And in increasingly in uh, formal and informal environments, computer science is actually acting as a pathway into STEM education, the coding class, the try building a game actually gets you more interested and makes you want to do more. I mean, I certainly remember that when I was in college. I took CS as a lark, and I still remember our first, uh, first homework was building a droplet app on Java. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I, uh, you know, in all the political science classes I was taking, you know, there'd be this kind of, oh, eventually, uh, you're gonna see what the result of all your academic study is. But, um, not in computer science. So I think we just need to grapple with how this is just continuing to grow, and we can actually see this as a real opportunity. The third thing I would just say is, um, and I'm sure, and I think, um, you know, your previous keynote speaker, you know, Ed sort of went at this as well, but I think we are only still just starting to grapple with how much equity animates all of the work. You know, last time I was actually one of my, uh, it's interesting to come back to Hartford, I haven't been here in a few years, but one of the previous times I was here was I was with, um, uh, a, college, uh, with a group of students who were suing the state of Connecticut for underfunding the school system. And you know, Connecticut, I think people sort of think about it as a well-off state, but the 10 poorest school districts in Connecticut are some of the poorest school districts in America because Connecticut, even though it's a small state, breaks itself up into 170 school districts. And then 
uh, those poor school districts actually don't have the tax revenue to actually uh, teach their kids. So we were here fighting for the right for um, a state education before the Connecticut Supreme Court, and we won. Uh, it started as a lawsuit that no one thought, you know, it was a bunch of law students that were the, uh, doing the uh, legwork, and we were up against the Connecticut AG, and, you know, they thought we would lose, and we thought we would lose. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the underlying facts of the case showed the, the sort of deep uh, inequities. Now, the case has continued on uh, and continues to go th through the ups and downs, but that was, I think, just the beginning. But if you just sort of look at the past couple of years of research, I think you will, the idea of what the social gap is just continues to go up. So there was uh, new research from Rod Chetty that looked at 1.4 million patent holders and said, what were the life experiences those people had as kids? What was really surprising was the, the factor that mattered more than everything else was did you have exposure to an adult in a STEM industry that said this might be relevant to you. That was the biggest factor. It wasn't whether the kid had really good math scores in third grade, which is what the researchers thought would be the biggest predictor. It was access to a mentoring adult. And one way that they teased this out that I thought was really interesting is if you moved, so like between high school and going to college, if your family moved, the chance that you would end up in a STEM industry was still connected to where you grew up. So if you grew up in Detroit, the chance that you might become an innovator in the car industry, even though your family moved to you know, uh, Atlanta, was still way higher than any of the regional industry in Atlanta. The things you get exposed to as a kid matter a lot. And that was, you know, on one level, I'm sure all of you were like, of course. But I think it surprised a lot of the economists that looked at this. And I think if you actually look at, you know, Robert Putnam's new book on our kids, you know, the best way to summarize that book is it's a bunch of scissor graphs. And each scissor graph shows that well-off parents are spending a lot more on their kids than middle-income and low-income parents. So uh, one of the stats that really stayed with me from that book is today, the most well-off parents, top 20%, sp spend seven times as much, seven times as much uh, than uh, middle-class parents on what is called enrichment. Now, I always say to people, you know, we have these, all these debates, and we used to have them inside the administration, around like, you know, uh, where, how we build the evidence base for, for after school and making sure after school has the, has the same seat at the table as formal learning, and I would say, Look at where parents are spending the money. Well-off parents are spending a lot of money making sure their kids get this extra, these extra hours of instruction and learning and deep engagement. Unless they're just throwing it away, we have to actually grapple with what that extra spending is doing. And the second part is, you know, uh, they estimated that this differential leads to a 6,000 hour gap by the time you get to middle school in uh, high quality learning opportunities. So it really is equity all the way down. So the role that you all play in your communities in giving this access to more kids matters a lot. Um, you know, this connects to the economics of learning argument that, you know, ultimately we have to grapple with the way money is being spent. The next one, and I think this will be uh, kind of um, clear to all of you, but doesn't come up in many formal education settings, which is that most of the time, we spend a lot of time on inputs that are, oh, what are the instructional materials that kids are getting? What are the quality of the teachers? But we spend very little time on the peer dynamics of young learners. So, you know, there's all this research that shows if you go to college, what do you think predicts most what your college major will be? Your college roommate, even in random assignment. What does, that, what does that tell us? We are affected by the people around us. And so how do we create high quality peer experiences that actually get us excited matters a lot. And then finally, I'll just say that um, this generation of young people is constantly asking, how does, this, how does this help me connect to the community around me? And I think you all can play an essential role. So, 
I know, um, you know, um, Kristen's title inside the administration, she had the best business card. I mean, literally, I've been at things where people said, I might follow up, but I just kind of want the business card. <laughs> and uh, she was the White House Assistant Director for Grand Challenges. This is before she became uh, Chief of Staff for OSTP. Um, and uh, I know the next uh, meeting theme is gonna be about moonshots. And what I wanted to just sort of do as sort of the, the final bit, it just, you know, sometimes when we sort of talk about these sort of big ideas, you know, social inequity, it can make us feel a little small. But I will tell you that when you're working for the, pre for the president and you get to talk to him once, you know, once every couple of months or less, and he says, all right, let's make math and science a big deal and let's put us back at the forefront you can also be like, well, how do I get started? And I just want to sort of talk through a couple of ways that we sort of approach this. So uh, this is just mostly me being nervous when we were getting some of these charges. Um, and you know, some of this was sort of covered in the bio, but I'll just sort of run through one of the things that was um, on uh, a board that um, was in our team uh, inside the White House that, used, that we used to sort of drive some of these conversations. So this is too small for you to read. It's mostly evocative. But it was a board that we wrote because it is just hard to know how to get started. And we faced this problem when we worked inside the building as well. And so often, once we started to figure out some tactic for being effective, we would just write it down on the board. And eventually, people said, don't erase the board. So it lasted all the way till the end. And then Secret Service let me walk it out of the building. So I still have it. So let me just run through a handful of the ones that uh, stay with me even now. The first one, think of the end at the beginning. This, all of these will sound very obvious. I'm just sort of promising you, right? But think of the end of the beginning just means that often we just get stuck in meetings where we say, well, my job is just to like speak up and say, here's a way to make this 2% better. But actually, if we start from what our goals are, which is I want to get this program going in my community. Uh, hey, that science cafe was really cool. How do I bring that to my community so that by this time next year, we have that program? Actually being able to say it that way, I want to bring science cafe within a year to my community is a much better way to organize because then you can work backwards. Next one. I think that we felt this, but I think all of us feel this. It is so easy to start with just thinking about the things that you already do, and rather than taking a step back and saying, what should be our collective to-do list? Because we just say, well, I'll use the tools that are right, above, right in front of me. But if you actually take a step back and you say, well, what could you know, the biggest employers in my community do? What could the hospital in my community do? What could the university leaders in my community do? What could everybody in my community do to meet this goal? and come up with that list and that to-do list, you can then call them. And it sounds crazy because it sounds, everybody feels busy, but if you actually create your imagine if list for everybody in your community that can step up and then call them, you know, what's the worst that can happen? They'll say no, right? But a, many more people will step up onto your call to action than you might have imagined. Third one, this is my favorite, I'll tell you, which is, there are people who want to help you. You just have to find them. And they're the people who show up after your meeting and say, hey, I've got some ideas. Rather than being like, oh my God, I'm busy, I gotta go back to my desk, you wanna give those people ways to help you because none of this work happens all by ourselves. So find those doers, connect with them, make them feel connected to your work and empower them. Use the schedule. We get scared of our schedule. We're like, oh my God, we have so much to do. But the fact that we have so much to do and moments where we will get to talk about our work actually drives our ability to get those things done. So one thing that's on the schedule is this conference in a year. So one thing I wanna impress upon you is what can you have ready to announce by this conference next year? And I'm sure if you asked Kristen and Chris and others, hey, I've been working on something, can I announce my personal moonshot and my personal uh, progress on that moonshot? 
they would let you. <laughs> Finally, always take time to celebrate. We make progress in small steps. It's only when we look back do we realize that we have made so much progress. Everything that was on that board started with an idea, started with a plan, started with the first step. It's only eight years later that you're like, wow, that was a lot of stuff we got done. So, I would love to talk to you afterwards about what are other things that you would love to add to this board. I am so appreciative of this community. I think that you're doing the most important work that can happen to make sure our kids are ready for the future that they face. So, thank you again for having me, and thank you to Kristen and team for inviting me. They're letting me uh, have a few more minutes so that you all can ask me questions, which is my favorite part. Now, uh, I will call on people. Where? These are bright lights, so anybody have reflections? Yes, sir. Do I have an eyeballs in the fridge moment? So mine is a little bit, uh, it will sound a little negative, but so I was in middle school and uh, we were, I was taking art science and the teacher, I, I was like big on the Guinness Book of World Records, I don't know why. So I like loved the Guinness, so I had spent a bunch of time just reading that book again and again, so I just knew lots of random facts in it. And one of the facts that's in it is that, you know what the hottest planet is? Anybody know the hottest planet? Venus. The hottest planet is Venus because Venus has an atmosphere, makes it really hot. Mercury does not. And the teacher says, you know, closest to the sun, Mercury's the hottest. You know, I raise my hand. <laughs> Actually, you know, you're like a kid, you're like, I'm like, Actually, Venus is the hottest because of an atmosphere. She's like, No, it's not. <laughs> Moves on. And I was like, what is going on? I have read this in a book. So I go home and I'm like, okay, she must be right. I'm gonna read this in a book. I look in the book and it says, Venus is the hottest and it makes sense that it's the hottest. So I take it back in the next day and I'm like, look, it's in the book. It says it's the hottest. She's like, the book's wrong. <laughs> and I was like so incensed because I was like, she didn't even explain why. And I don't know why that stays with me, but for like that, that moment was like the moment where I was like, I can figure things out and not every adult is correct. <laughs> so I, it's a little negative. I don't, you know, you always need your like Spartacus moment. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> to make that change and to be profound and disruptive in our own uh, industry. I mean, you like laid it all out. Give us some advice. Push us. So, so I think, um, well, one, I don't have the answers, but I think, um, I think what's really important is to like actually go back to like our lives as children and build back up, which is I think often when we assume roles of you know, setting policy, we sort of step away and we say, well, what does the research tell us? And we just forget what all the inputs are that make children children. So that's why I think thinking about the, the role of identity is really important. So one uh, research paper recently that I read that really, you know, like the researchers kind of skipped past this. And I was like, you know, it was like two sentences in the paper. So the research paper was studying comprehensive STEM high schools. You know, these sort of schools that pull people, uh, pull kids from, you know, underrepresented kids from middle schools and put them in a comprehensive STEM high school. And what they found was that 
you know, did this in North Carolina, African American girls and girls overall do a lot better in these schools. They take like five times as many STEM courses when they're in these schools. And the researchers kind of speculate at the end. And they said, oh, well, one of the things that might be happening is just that, you know, it's just, it's less cognitively taxing to just load up on STEM classes, which I think we have to kind of grapple with, which is in the, in the United States, being a science kid is an identity. And it's an out identity, right? It's like, oh, I, it's like an other, it's like a thing you choose to do. Which, which girls and underrepresented uh, kids have to then take that affirmative step. But when you're in a school where everybody just takes that, it's just like a given, you don't have to take that affirmative step and you end up in many instances taking a lot more. And so the research has kind of moved past that really fast. But I think these kind of identity questions frame a lot of decisions for kids. What kind of kid am I? Am I, am I gonna say I'm gonna do this? Um, and so I, I don't have one big advice, but I would just say that we just have to unpack the lives of children and say, how are we actually empowering them to be the confident adults we want them to be? Who was rolling when you see it? So the, the, that one ends up on the board being the most controversial because I, we really should have read, written steer and row because a big part of like all of this work is to actually model what you want to people to do, so it's not that you're not gonna do it. It's, it often ends up being that too often people uh, think that the way to show leadership is to assign themselves all the work. It's like, oh, I'm gonna show that we're gonna really get sorted. I'll, you know, here's, here's all the action steps out of the meeting, and they're all like, I'll, you know, I'll follow up. And that might seem easier, but it actually means less people go along for the ride. Yes? Hi, I'm Gretchen Walker from the Tech in San Jose. And my question is, is there any moonshot that was still on that whiteboard when you left the White House that you want to push out to this group to get done? It's a great question. So I, you know, there were certainly a lot of scenario planning for what post-administration would look like. I don't think we necessarily scenario planned for what happened. Um, you know, one thing that uh, was definitely, uh, you know, I think, you know, we were big believers in the maker movement, and we had done a lot of work to, s to start to build connections between what is the informal, sort of broad, sort of hobbyist culture, and start to build links into both informal and formal institutions. But I think we were just scratching the surface, because, um, a lot of what makes the maker movement a true movement, the inverse of it is that it is still not touching a lot of communities, uh, diverse communities, underrepresented communities, urban and rural communities. So if I had to sort of think about a key challenge, I think it's pairing the passion and kind of real wellspring of enthusiasm that comes in for the maker movement, but then really thinking about how do we get it in front of more kids. And I think that was something that certainly was on my to-do list on what we do, and then, you know, now in my role in philanthropy, it's certainly something that we're actively trying to invest against. Yes? Um, no matter what industry a kid is in, I think it's really important for us to help, help people get an early start in information literacy, like how to evaluate the information that they're seeing on YouTube and everything. Have you seen uh, examples of successful ways to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. So my kids are, um, I've got three kids. My daughters are five. And what's crazy is, so we let them watch a little bit of sort of YouTube in the morning while they're eating breakfast, is that they don't understand the please subscribe line, but they will say it when they role play. <laughs> Does that make sense? So they will be like, they'll role play some, you know, they're playing together. And then one of them will be like, please subscribe <laughs> to the other one. What is happening? <laughs> so like, they clearly, they've like picked up that behavior from watching the video, but they don't actually yet know what it is. And I'm like, concerned, obviously. <laughs> it's like a parental posture, like what is happening? They're like, look down for the comments. And I'm like, what, what? you don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> um, so I, if you find out a good answer, you should tell me. I, you know, 
there's, there's a one big philosophical question that happens in all the folks who try to do policy around kids and the internet, which is how much are you fighting the bad versus how much are you building up the good, right? So Mr. Rogers is a big part of the way we fight the medium wars is you just come up with exceptional content and then that's what wins and then there's a whole worldview which is we can actually uh, regulate. You know, I don't have one strong view. I do think that the role this community can play is to exemplify the good and to take a lot of the lessons that you're learning about how to engage kids and say how does that happen in mixed use settings, including digital. Awesome, thank you so much.